This programme was produced by the Aotearoa Media Collective for RNZ and TVNZ, made with the support of the Māngai Pāho and the New Zealand On Air Public Interest Journalism Fund. And a quick note, this episode was first aired in December 2023, before the recent developments in our political landscape. Well, the ballot papers have been counted and the results are in. The referendum for the voice to Parliament has been defeated. It is an overwhelming no. The referendum will not pass. Tonight's result is not one that I had hoped for. It was the vote that shocked the Indigenous people of Australia. You know, I, I, I don't know what's next, but, um, but uh, it's just devastating. Their fellow countrymen decisively rejecting a proposal to recognise them in the Constitution. It was a rejection. It was wrong. It was unfair. And the same may happen here. They have invented a principle of the treaty that it's about a partnership between races. With race relations in Aotearoa being set on a collision course. We will also advance ACT's Treaty Principles Act. It will be drafted, voted on, sent to select committee and consulted on. Debating democratically what our founding document means in the modern age. Uh, deserves to continue through later stages and to referendum. You need to be ready for the tactics of intimidation that will come to try and silence you. If you don't know... A chilling warning to Aotearoa. Could the same sort of strategies seen in Australia play out here as ACT seeks to redefine the status of Te Tiriti o Waitangi? The Voice to Parliament referendum held here in Australia divided the country and ultimately delivered a devastating blow to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. So what happens when we put the rights of Indigenous people into the hands of the majority? question. Should the Australian Constitution be altered to recognise the First Peoples of Australia through a voice to Parliament? Initially support for the voice to Parliament was strong. The sorrow and soul searching is underway in the Yes camp. Instead, the majority of Australians voted against it. This campaign has never been about just yes or no. Like many Indigenous Australians, Yes advocate Thomas Mayo was left shattered by the results, saying it set back reconciliation efforts by decades. This has been about justice. I just feel empty, you know? I feel like there's a, an emptiness in, in my chest and it's, I guess I'm dragging my heart around along, along the ground nowadays, just, um, uh, just so, so devastated uh, about the result. After a bruising campaign, we've come to Darwin to meet with Mayo. I am a, a Kararag, Kukugal and Arabamle man, so um, those nations are in the Torres Strait. The unionist turned yes vote campaigner as he comes to terms with one of the darkest moments in Australia's Indigenous history. We're on the lands of the Larrakia people, so I pay respect and on our behalf to the Larrakia people and their elders past and present. It all began with such hope. We call for the establishment of First Nation voice enshrined in the Constitution. In 2017, the voice to Parliament was proposed in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a document that set out a roadmap for Indigenous reconciliation with wider Australia. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship. What did you believe it would achieve? Well, I, I really believed that it would lead to change and that's why I was so passionate about it. What they were asking for was simple. The creation of an Indigenous body called the Voice to Parliament that could provide advice to the government on Indigenous issues. I knew it was a modest proposal, just setting up a representative body. Uh, we weren't seeking to usurp Parliament or to be able to veto legislation. We were seek simply seeking uh, the ability to speak our minds, basically, collectively. Indigenous leaders believe that to make it work, the majority of Australians would have to back them. And I say to my fellow Australians, 
Parliaments pass laws, but it is people who make history. They wanted a referendum to ensure the voice to Parliament couldn't be used as a political football by future governments. Is it fair to put Indigenous rights into the hands of the majority? It's not fair. Uh, nothing about colonisation and our powerlessness in our own country is fair. But to see a reform that is lasting, that can survive the political cycles and the um, tactics that they use to scapegoat Indigenous people for our own problems, we had to go to the Australian people. So the stage was set. The voice to Parliament would be put to a vote. In August 2022, shortly after Prime Minister Anthony Albanese released the proposed wording for the Voice to Parliament referendum, opinion polls showed 75% of Australians supported a yes vote. But a year later, on election night, that support had changed significantly, with 60% of Australians voting no. So why did 35% of Australians flip to a no vote? But we understood that it would be difficult. But what was a surprise was the intensity and the quantity of the toxic vitriol that was aimed at anybody that put their head up uh, and also the level of disinformation. Two prominent leaders in the No campaign were Indigenous political figures, Warren Mundine and Conservative Australian Senator Jacinta Nambinjaba Price. I wonder if a good section of the people who voted no would vote differently if they knew. Australian academic Dr Jeremy Walker is a senior lecturer in political science in Sydney. He says the Mundine and Price No campaign came out of the gate like a freight train. Come on, Australia. And no Let's one saw United. it coming. But no to the voice of division. They were everywhere all of a sudden, everywhere on every television station, on the, on the news, and the social media was flooded with pictures of them. And they had several very... The key one was um, that the voice will divide us by race. And now that's very interesting because literally that's what they did. Now we have a choice to make. Do we give in to guilt and division or do we say no? So what that did was to introduce racist discourse into the... And that was their thing they said over and over, number one. And that unleashed, as well as all of these untraceable bots on social media, with this very racist imagery, that basically created a licence for people to express overtly racist sentiment and attack um, Indigenous people, and particularly anyone associated with the campaign. Thomas Mayo, were you targeted by the No campaign? You know, I was certainly one of the, the top targets of the No campaign. I think uh, they used the angry black man trope, but it showed me basically dancing for money, uh, you know, with raggedy trousers, you know, a typical racist trope. And I'll tell you what, we are sick of governments not listening to our voice. We are going to use the rule book of the nation to force them. There is nothing more powerful than building a First Nations voice, a black institution, a black political force to be reckoned with. Keep going until we change the system, until we tear down the institutions that harm our people. There was a fear-mongering, uh, you know, effort from the No campaign to tell people that they were going to lose their backyard or their farm or that they would have to pay fees to go to the beach if Indigenous people had a voice. All of these things that were completely false. Um, it was an advisory body that we were proposing. It was genuinely modest. So who are Warren Mundine and Jacinta Price? Well, both of them come out of the conservative advocacy group Advance Australia. Advance Australia pitched itself as ordinary Aussies with mainstream values, worried about what woke elites were doing to their country. But an investigation by the Australian independent news organisation Claxon found that Advance Australia is bankrolled by actual elites, some of Australia's richest people. Advance Australia is just one of the many right-wing think tanks with links to the little-known global organisation, the Atlas Network. The network was established in 1981 to promote free market policies around the world. Dr Jeremy Walker. 
the purpose of the Atlas Network was to litter the world with free market think tanks. That basically, the purpose was to create all of these institutions, institutes that would present themselves as research institutes, um, and to, to flood the world with these institutes. There are five to six hundred think tanks linked to Atlas with fairly innocuous names, such as the Centre for Independent Studies, where in Australia, Warren Mundine is the director. The Centre for Independent Studies um, won't tell you who funds them now, but we know who founded them, and that's certainly a matter of record. They were founded by oil and gas uh, mining, uranium interests, in the late 70s. Dr Walker studies the Atlas Network. He says it receives some of its funding from oil and gas interests who oppose Indigenous rights that could threaten the fossil fuel industry. This is about rights, land rights. It's about land rights. It's about, um, you know, so one thing that's consistent across all of these Atlas Network think tanks is that we'll oppose anything that gets in the way of the fossil fuel industry, whether it's climate policy, uh, indigenous land rights. Now, a warning to Māori. Free market think tanks undermined the support for the yes vote in Australia. Could that happen here if a referendum were to be held on the Treaty of Waitangi? Should we be worried about a treaty referendum? It will be relentless, it will be very well funded and it will be dark. I worry for you guys in New Zealand Having been through what I've been through, it's going to be a tough, tough fight for you. And that fight has now arrived on the streets of Aotearoa. This month, thousands protested moves against the status of the treaty. If, if they had a coherent message, that would be great. But they're trying to say that a government who stands for treating all people the same uh, is racist. ACT campaigned for a referendum on the treaty and a treaty principles bill. While the referendum didn't get across the line in the coalition negotiations, the government has agreed to support the bill through to select committee. If it were to be successful, it could prompt a referendum. And a citizens-initiated referendum may still be on the cards. Well, the reality is that uh, what Mr Seymour's asked for, he's got. And whether that happens will depend on the wisdom of the submissions to the select committee and what new information that Parliament accepts to be true to take it forward in the way Mr Seymour needs. Treaty expert and lawyer Moana Tufare. I think if we, we're in a position as a society where the voting public in general had a very good understanding of the principles of the treaty and the way in which um, the treaty relationship was intended when it was first agreed and the context in which we find ourselves, um, you know, grappling with issues like co-governance or any other, you know, relevant kind of treaty-related topic, then, you know, OK, let's put the question to everybody. But we're not there. I think it's a really intellectually dishonest uh, way of approaching what is actually quite a nuanced and contextual question. What are your thoughts on the way, you know, a potential treaty referendum is being handled? A referendum is a yes or no vote to a very defined and specific question. It is not a debate. And yes, if we want to have a healthy debate, which I absolutely support, let's do that. But let's not leave it up to the largely uninformed voting public to make a largely uninformed decision about the place of the treaty. I think people have a right to specific property. Everyone has a right to property under a treaty which gives the same rights and duties, that gives self-determination over your taonga. However, uh, it's not true that you should forever in a day have a different right to sit at certain tables to govern certain entities because of your ancestry. This is a democracy. That's what the treaty did. That's what it did. It wasn't, a di there's no end date on Te Tiriti. I okay. think you've got the treaty uh, wrong and I think that your version Kapai. of how, your version of how the world should be has no successful parallel anywhere in the world. Iwi leader, Paul Majuri.
As we know, there's been an evolution of thinking as time has gone on, um, from a simple nullity, uh, to use the language of many years ago, through to it being a very live, an important, founding, enduring and living document. And it's been the place for the courts to do that, going back to the lands cases of the 1980s, um, where principles came about. Uh, that's the place where that takes place. And of course, it's for the politicians to determine um, through Parliament uh, how the treaty is reflected in legislation. And that's been an involved journey, as we've seen as well. Alongside the treaty bill, the new government has pledged to scrap the Māori Health Authority, end co-governance, and minimise te reo Māori. Community activist Cassie Hardendorp from Action Station says fostering a sense of resentment is a powerful tactic for undermining equity for Indigenous people. For example, naming the so-called Indigenous elite, a group of Indigenous people who apparently have this power over a non-elite Indigenous group. So that was being said both over in the referendum in Australia, and that has been coming up in our country. Have you seen similarities between what happened in Australia and what's been happening here? So some of the things that were similar included fear-based tactics, right? So this idea that there is something to be afraid of, of Indigenous people having their rights in the country that they come from, the idea of something being taken away, the idea that actually Indigenous rights are divisive. We just need to create this equal world. We're not realising that the converse is true. The whole reason that we need to have our rights enshrined within our constitutional documents is because we were not on an equal footing in the first place after colonisation. So we're seeing our words being thrown back at us, that suddenly Indigenous people are the div divisive ones, Māori are being divisive. That, that's simply not true. Josh Drummond is an investigative freelance journalist born in Australia, but now a proud Kiwi. He says it was heart-wrenching to watch the Voice to Parliament referendum fail. As an Australian, damn, <laughs> it just sucked. Um, they did such a number on it. The, the Yes campaign was so unprepared. They thought that the righteousness of their cause, and I think it was righteous, were, was going to take them through. And if that was what they thought, they were wrong. They were really wrong. The, the No campaign was really well run, really well organised, really well financed. Drummond has been tracking the Atlas Network and its links to hundreds of think tanks around the world, including here in Aotearoa. They are a network of um, like-minded think tanks. They're kind of like a corporate sponsor of think tanks. Their, their idea is to seed think tanks throughout the world um, and who all share the same uh, economic and social dogma, which is neoliberalism. It's always neoliberalism, laissez-faire capitalism, uh, it's almost always opposed to Indigenous rights and it is nearly universally opposed to climate change action. How do they spread their message? They have university educated people who have a very uh, orthodox view of how economics work. And their job is to produce paper after paper after paper after paper that says, we're right, your boss is right, rich people are right. One high-profile member of the Atlas Network here is the Taxpayers' Union, a think tank which targets issues that get the taxpayer hopping mad. They find issues that either are hot buttons or they can turn them into hot buttons. And the most recent example that I can think of is co-governance. When that word started appearing in incredibly boring legislation like Three Waters, the Taxpayers' Union pounced. Hobson's Pledge pounced. This was part of the modification of New Zealand and they all worked their different angles. Uh, the Taxpayers' Union paid for signs that people could put up in their front yard, which is why you can't move without seeing a Stop Three Waters sign. How do they get their point across? This is just people taking advantage of the way that media works. Media needs information, uh, it wants conflict, and it wants expertise. These are people who will always pick up the phone, who will always deliver a soundbite. Tonight's voice update and why you should vote no. Media academics say the Voice to Parliament referendum shows what can happen when opinion and commentary is given more airtime than traditional news gathering. Auckland University of Technology lecturer Richard Pamatato. The news reporting was pretty down the middle, but 
People now are attached to angertainment, to infotainment, and the commentariat are the people now who have a bigger sway rather than the straight news journalists, and that is a real worry for democracy. What were some of the reoccurring themes in the Australian coverage? Well, the, there were a number of messages that were, were really, really destructive. One of them was that if this passes, the Aboriginals are going to take control of the country. You're going to lose your land. And we're seeing something similar here around the treaty, which is if we let Māori get away with more, then they're going to take over. How do we cover the bill fairly here? With the bill and the possible referendum, the media is going to be critical. And it can be critical either as a, a force for good, for want of a better term, or else just perpetuating destruction and misinformation. And we've become so used to that with COVID and we're following the United States model where you can say anything and get away with it. Josh Drummond, do you think there'll be a referendum? Yes, I think there will be a referendum. The lobby groups that ACT works closely with, and in fact, you could pretty much see them as the same organisations, will agitate really hard behind the scenes for the bill. They'll say, this is what's necessary. It will finally get us to one law for all. It'll end the Māoriification of everything. It will um, it'll, you know, bring the tribal elites down, all those buzzwords that they use. They'll, um, they'll just try to make it look like there's either overwhelming debate or overwhelming support for that, um, that bill at Select Committee. What impact will it have on race relations here? I think it will be terrible for race relations, possibly the worst thing that you could do for race relations in New Zealand. New Zealand's deficit We asked the Taxpayers' Union's Executive Director, Jordan Williams, for an interview, but we're told its board hasn't yet discussed whether it will take a position on a possible treaty referendum. But just this month, it hosted Lord Daniel Hannan. Today, I mean, I'm really excited to see all the, all the coalition partners around this table. Um, Hannan is the director I, I'm, of two right-wing think I'm tanks connected the to the Atlas Network. Able, and I'm sure the politicians here will recognise the important contribution that comes from the, the wider movement, right? The penumbra, the halo around the right of centre parties, uh, not least organisations like our hosts, the Taxpayers' Union. And he's met with the ACT Party leader, David Seymour, who's also a guest at this event. And I think there's been a, an issue here where both, frankly, both judges and politicians have been creating problems by going beyond the text of a successful treaty and uh, adding, let's say, ruling on the basis of what they think it ought to have said rather than what it actually says. We're moving away from the idea of equal citizenship before the law, we are introducing, or reintroducing, I should say, the idea of uh, being defined by birth or caste or ancestry or physiognomy. This is Trinity Lake. This is Manamotu Hake Jubin. And this is Mokobuna Inspired. Iwi are already activating. Ngai Thirangi has filed an urgent claim with the Waitangi Tribunal against the government for undermining Te Reo Māori. And Iwi leaders have put the government on notice including Tiki Nitama. You know, I'm here to send a message, and the message is that we will fight this government. And in the you... courts, in the courts, in the streets, in social media, in every platform available to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to our people, we have begun to, to, uh, to strategize and to mobilize our resources. Paul Majuri. The treaty is uh, the founding document of our country. Um, the highest courts in the land have said so. And so the, the concept that through essentially a, a poll um, can determine uh, what are the rights and interests in, in the treaty and that what goes with the principles pretty much flies in the face of every uh, convention around constitutional documents in the world. How would you describe the new government's approach to Māori? It can be a, you know, a potential slippery slope in terms of seeking something that the base clearly wants, um, but is that good politics? And we'll see how that plays out. As Indigenous Australians come to terms with losing a place in the country's constitution, they leave Māori with this final piece of advice. Don't underestimate the threat to the treaty and be prepared for the fight of your lives. You guys, uh, Māori people, uh, Pakia, that are allies, will need to be more united than ever. Uh, 
do not take it for granted. Throw everything that you can at defending uh, the progress that you have made because it can easily be lost from what I've seen. What warning do you have for Māori? You need to be ready for the tactics of intimidation that will come uh, to try and silence you. Um, don't let them do that. Uh, you've got to stand up and reach out and bring people along with you to defend everything that you've gained and to see the progress that Māori people deserve. For more Mata content, check out our podcast at rnz.co.nz forward slash Mata.